All right, oh. everybody, welcome to another uh, monthly meeting of the St. Augustine's Business Entrepreneurs and Private Practice Student Special Interest Group. Uh, we have a very special guest tonight, um, local to Texas uh, for, for the time being now, uh, been here a while, uh, business owner, CEO of Ice Shaker, Chris Gronkowski. Chris, thanks so much for coming on tonight and educating all the, uh, the students who really want to learn more about business and entrepreneurship. Uh, we appreciate you coming on here. Uh, if you don't mind, could you tell us a little bit about your journey to where, where you're at today, your career and how it's led you to what you're doing now? Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a good run, man. Uh, let's see. Started in Buffalo, New York. I'm the middle of the five Gronkowski brothers. Uh, four of us went on to play in the NFL, the oldest brother. I got drafted into the minor leagues for baseball. So uh, sports was always a big thing, competing, uh, man, just from day one and everything that we did, I think just helped us become better athletes, but um, really also helped us afterwards uh, in business as well. You know, we knew how to put that work in. We had to earn everything we had as kids. Uh, nothing was handed to us. And, you know, that mentality kind of just stuck with us. So uh, I played four years NFL uh, afterwards, actually started a business with my wife. Uh, did that for about five years. It was super successful. She still has it today. Uh, it was more based around wedding gifts, uh, customized gifts. And after about five years, I realized that, you know, that wasn't really my passion. Uh, the five-year point, I thought of the idea for Ice Shaker, saw an opportunity in the market, and I jumped on it uh, doing something that I love doing, which was, you know, going to the gym. So I uh, jumped onto that opportunity, started it as a side hustle. You know, was grinding out of the upstairs of my house here, shipping product out after hours, uh, and eventually led to an opportunity to get onto ABC Shark Tank. Uh, we landed a deal with Mark Cuban, Alex Rodriguez. It went from, you know, this side hustle to a full-time job overnight. Uh, that was almost five years ago now. So, um, you know, we grew uh, immediately afterwards, you know, probably, man, I would say 20X that first year. Uh, went from $80,000 in sales in the first six months uh, to after Shark Tank. The first 12 months after Shark Tank, we did about $3 million. Uh, and then really game plan from that point forward was to grow at least 30% every year, uh, which we've been able to accomplish. So going into year six now, uh, learned so much. Wish I knew everything I knew now uh, you know, back then when I had that opportunity on Shark Tank. But, uh, man, every year is a chance to get better. Every day is a chance to get better. And I use that to do so. So. Uh, networking is huge. I love coming on, joking on groups like this, uh, talking to new people, meeting new people. There's always new opportunities. And I uh, love sharing the knowledge as well. You know, there's so much that I wish I knew back then. If I could give one person here tonight a hint, a tip, whatever it is that helps them excel to that next level that much faster, you know, that's huge for me. I love seeing people take what I taught them and actually put it you know, to use and, and do it the right way. So, uh, would love some questions today. Hope I bring some value today as well. And, uh, you know, that's where I'm at today. Awesome, man. Yeah. I, I, you know, it, the journey has been amazing just watching your growth and stuff. Like I said, I, I think we first met probably, I don't know, about three or four years ago at that fantasy football conference. And just to see, you know, you guys explode from there has been awesome. Um, Tell, tell the group a little bit, if you don't mind, about your why behind entrepreneurship. Why did, why did you decide to, to get into this and really to pursue your own thing and, and start your own thing? Man, for me, it's always, it's always been about passion. Um, I, I don't think entrepreneurship was something I thought I would be doing. Uh, I actually didn't think it was. You know, I went to school. I got an accounting degree. I didn't think I'd play in the NFL. I got one chance, one opportunity, I made a team and um, the rest was history. But um, man, I tell people all the time, like my why is I was just super passionate about going to the gym, about health, about fitness. And I wanted to find a way to get back into that. I didn't know how I never thought it would be a shaker bottle. Uh, but you know, that's what it ended up being. So, um, my passion for fitness, going to the gym, I was going probably seven days a week at that point. I still probably go at least five days a week, but, um, you know, super passionate about it. And when I thought of this idea, I'm like, that's it. Like, I can go to the gym. I can call it work. I can work in this industry that I grew up in. My dad's been in the fitness industry for 32 years selling fitness equipment. That's who I am. That was my identity. Uh, so for me, I followed that passion and I found a way to make a living uh, with, with something that I love doing. Yeah, that, that's huge, right? Because I think uh, 
you know, they say if, if, if you find something that you love, right, you never have to work a day in your life, right? And, and I think it's a cliche phrase, but I think at the same time, it's true, right? If, if you're not passionate about something, it's very easy to give up when the going gets tough. You know, it's, it, it's very easy to just turn it off and be like, nah, not, not into it, not feeling it, you know? So That's I think, exactly. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, still, it's still work for sure. It's yeah. still work. No matter how much you love it uh, and how much you're passionate about it, at some point, you know, even playing the NFL, you know, people would say, you know, it must be nice playing a game. There was a game once a week. The other six days were work, you know, yeah. and it, it was hard work. You know, it wasn't easy work. So uh, even if you are super passionate about it, you still got to put that work in if you want to be successful. Uh, but you're not going to give up on it. That's the thing. You know, if you don't really love it and it starts getting hard, it starts not going the way that you wanted it to go. If it was just all about money from day one. The second it starts going downhill, you're done, you're out, you're, you know, you're finished with it. But if you truly love it, you're truly passionate about it, you're going to find a way to win no matter what. I mean, the first shipment we got, 10,000 bottles, half of them were bad. I could have gave up right then and there. My mm -hmm. wife's business crushing it. I had money in the bank. I was cool. I didn't need to start anything else. I just kept going because I, I loved it. You know, I was all in on it. I was super passionate about it. That's all I was talking about. When you get to that point where that's all you talk about, you know, because you love something so much, that's when you know you, you're passionate about it to make it successful because you can't stop talking about it. So that's where I was at. And I just kept going. You know, I, I wasn't going to give up on it, even though it was extremely hard. I mean, building anything from the ground up, uh, once you do it, you have so much more respect for everyone else that's built uh, amazing companies and products because it, it isn't easy, no matter you know, who you are, what your following is, anything like that. People don't just buy unless you know you you give them a reason to unless there's reviews unless you know there's there's everything that they want to see you know it's very hard to get a customer so uh it's a grind no matter no matter who you are it's it's going to be work yeah no i lo i love that take uh i'm going to i'm going to turn it over to the BEPP president Jose Diaz take it from here Jose why don't you go ahead and uh, open it up for Q&A go ahead and lead us off man well first off i just want to say thank you Chris for being here um, thank you for everybody else for being here too. I know we're kind of out of session right now. Um, but my first question to you, honestly, as you mentioned a business with your wife, what are like some of the pros and cons of being in business uh, with family? Man, that's a great question. That's a great question. It happens a lot, you know, because you go to the people that you trust first, you know, when you need help. Uh, and that's exactly what happened uh, with me in both businesses. It actually took me a while to finally realize that, hey, you know, it needs to be the best person, not just the person that you trust the most. It should be the best person for the job. But uh, pros, you know, you're going to trust that person all day, every day. Uh, you know, it's easy to give them the keys to the building. You know, it's easy to give them the credit card, the bank account, all that stuff, because you trust them, you know, them, especially your, your wife and your family. So uh, that's huge. Uh, the negatives is once it goes wrong, once something happens, if that structure isn't in place right from day one, if everyone doesn't know their responsibilities, it's so easy to step over boundaries and then it becomes a massive problem you know, because you can't just fire your wife without a huge issue or, you know, your brother or your brother-in-law, uh, you know, it, it becomes a huge family problem then uh, when you do that. So uh, when you do it, you know, make sure that you, you, you set boundaries from day one, treat it like, exactly like a job and make sure that it's all about business uh, because that's how it's got to be. Because at some point, if you don't, there's going to be problems and it's going to be way more and just business. And that's when you see a lot of businesses fail actually is just because, you know, you go in with family, you don't set those boundaries and you know something happens, it starts going south and, or, or you start doing really, really well. And then people are like, Hey, that's mine. You know, that's my piece. You know, why, you know, I, I, I have that ownership and, you know, then it becomes a problem at that point when you actually start doing really well. So either way, when it starts doing really bad or really good, it becomes a huge issue if you don't set those boundaries from day one. Got you. That makes sense. And being that we kind of have such a small group today, I feel like we could just kind of have a free for all here. So I got one more question for you before I, I we address the one in the chat. But um, being as you know, Shark Tank, such a big show, I'm a big fan of it. Um, how was that like being on the show? And how comparable was that comparable to other like big time moments in your life? You know, because I'm sure you've had plenty. Yeah, man. Um, I would say it was like, you know, it's like walking out for your first game. You know, you're super nervous, but you're super excited at the same time. Uh, you know, you're super prepared. You've done everything you can for that moment. 
Uh, but no matter what, no matter how much you prepare, you're still nervous until you finally get that first hit or, you know, you finally start talking and get that pitch over with. So uh, Shark Tank itself was, it was everything people think it is. You know, the exposure is absolutely massive. You have 5 million people watching it that day. People are recording it. You know, we still, it's like once a month, they play one of our reruns. Uh, we ended up getting the actual, the one year update because we did so well. So we have two episodes and every, it's like every month, one of them gets replayed and we get thousands of hits to our website each time they get replayed. We get a ton of sales to Amazon every time they replay. So the effects of Shark Tank still continue on uh, to this day. They're still, it's still crushing for us, but uh, all that money comes in, a uh, ton of sales come in. It's all without marketing dollars spent on it. So, you know, that's all high margin uh, dollars that are coming in the door. And the work just becomes insane, though. I, I guess that's the one thing people don't see is, you know, the sharks don't come in and take over your company. You know, they don't come in and you go chill on a private island. You know, all that work fell on me. And at that time, you know, it was a one man show. You know, I didn't have a full team. I didn't have the structure. I didn't have anything in place. So uh, to 20 extra business overnight, you know, really in that first week was probably more like 50 to 100 extra business. Uh, it, it's mayhem. You know, you're doing everything you can just to survive at that point. Uh, and that wave lasted, you know, we, we aired in October, lasted into November, right into the holiday season with December, right into New Year's resolution in January. And uh, it, it was just absolute mayhem. And then right when February hit, it all kind of just stopped. And at that point, it was like, man, I got to figure out how to actually run a business now, because that that free you know, traffic that's just being drove to the site has now stopped, you know, and it's time to figure out how to actually get things done. So. Man, one of the greatest opportunities for sure. Uh, but what most people don't see is just how much work actually comes behind it. Yeah, I honestly hadn't considered all that you just mentioned. <laughs> that was pretty overwhelming. Yeah, it's funny. I was watching a TikTok yesterday. This was this was driving me crazy because this girl had a TikTok and, uh, and I'm big on TikTok too. It's been a huge uh, driver of just really a lot of sales, but uh, just impressions, you know, millions of impressions. Uh, for me on my personal page, but with it, uh, she was talking about how she had one video go viral and it, and it got a couple million views on it. And she said, you know, I couldn't keep up. You know, I couldn't sleep for days. And I'm sitting there like, you don't even know that was, that was a couple million, uh, you know, on TikTok. You know, shark, the shark tank wave was, was, was massive. Just, just so much more than that. But, you know, she was in that spot where I was, where, you know, she has one, uh, she's one person, you know, has one, business, you know, creating little cards, uh, holiday cards and stuff like that, which is a lot of labor. And she just got hit with a massive wave of sales and it can become overwhelming pretty fast, but uh, I, I loved it. I loved it. That's for sure. Yeah, sweet. So we have a question in the chat, um, actually from our vice president. Um, she's asking, what is one crucial thing that you wish you had known prior to your entrepreneurial journey? One crucial thing, oh, there, there's a lot of crucial things. Um, I would say the hardest part, which a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, you're gonna struggle for a while, even after the business is doing well, uh, you know, you're still gonna be in a tight spot. So, you know, from day one, we were profitable, year one, we were profitable. Uh, you know, we get Shark Tank, it takes off. Uh, it was still two and a half years before I got my first penny back from the business. And I actually put a quarter million of my own money into the business myself too. Uh, so with that, uh, two and a half years, quarter million in, living off my wife's salary, I'm paying employees, I'm paying them well, but you know, everyone's like, man, it must be nice. You're crushing it. You're doing all this, but we're, we're growing a business. You know, I went from one SKU uh, to over 60 SKUs the first year to over 100 SKUs the second year. And with that, just a ton of cash flow. Uh, so I was doing everything I could to grow it as big and as fast as I possibly can. And I was willing to put that sacrifice in, but most people aren't, you know, going into it, they're not willing to do that. So uh, that my piece of advice is, you know, don't, don't expect to just be, you know, crushing it from day one. It's definitely going to be a struggle. And that's just a part of the journey, uh, you know, that you're going to go through. And it was definitely frustrating. Um, you know, when you live off of someone else's money for a while and you, you see the success, but you can't touch it, it's probably one of the hardest things to do. No, that must be tough. I got but you one know, for you, Chris. Back, you know, it's all coming back at some point. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, eventually you're, you're, it makes it worth it. 
for sure. I mean, you see it build and build and build. You see the profits. You know it's there. You know, you just you just can't touch it yet. Uh, you know, if you want to try to build it as fast as you can, and you know, you can take on debt, but it's gonna you know it's gonna come with interest. And you know, for me, it was just worth it. Um, I knew you know eventually that it was gonna be worth it if I if I just kept putting it back into the company. What are some of the traits that you think uh, were helpful for you getting a business started and getting a, a business running? Like, what are what are some of the things that you saw in yourself that you were like, oh man, it's a good thing I, I'm like this, or it's a good thing I know how to do this, or that you know, it's a good thing I'm I'm built that way. For sure, um, I think the first thing is you just have to be a problem solver. Uh, you're going to be doing things you never thought you would do. Uh, I was, you know, I was online looking up articles on YouTube, looking up stuff. Uh, you know, f- trying to figure out SEO for myself on Amazon. How do I get ranked at the top? How do I, I still take, I still take our product photos to this day. I'm still taking our product photos, editing them myself. Uh, all stuff I've never done, never thought I would do, uh, but I would just figure it out. You know, how do you, how do you get to that next step? How do you hire people? I mean, there's so many questions that you don't have the answer to, and you would never know that until you, you get put in a position like this. So uh, yeah, it's, it's the biggest skill I would say by far is kind of just like, figuring things out. How do you do this? You know, that, that, that's it. I, I think that's really at the end of the day, that's really what an entrepreneur is. Yeah. Problem solving 101 for sure. And it never ends. It never goes away. <laughs> no, it's just it's bigger just, problems to solve. The bigger you get. Absolutely. All right. Well, cool. hey, so sorry. Um, but you also mentioned like, you know, <clears throat> you having like that, um, ridiculous pace after Shark Tank, you still being a one man team. And then after that rush kind of died down, you said, all right, now it's time to really, you know, build the business. What were some of those first steps or like, what was the most important step that kind of let you kind of settle into a more comfortable pace, I guess? Yeah, for sure. Uh, It took me a while to actually get into a a spot where I I should have been a lot earlier, but uh, I had to hire. So I hired, um, of course I hired, friends and family, uh, because I, I really didn't know what I was doing at that time. Uh, so it was kind of like, hey, figure out, find whoever I could, bring them in, uh, and, and just kind of put them into whatever role uh, I could possibly, you know, get them into as fast as possible. So I uh, did that. Um, you know, I was still at that point, I would say for the first three years, managing really everything. I was still answering customer service emails, still ordering the products, still um, marketing, you know, putting up Facebook ads, figuring that all out. Uh, still even shipping and engraving orders. So uh, it took me really a, a pandemic and children to finally slow me down to the point where you know, I couldn't do it all myself. And I, at, at that point, it was, hey, I got to build a team. I got to figure this out. And I did it way too late. I tell people all the time, hire earlier, hire once you can, once you can afford it, bring them in so you can keep on building. Uh, but man, it, it was so weird because I was in all these amazing organizations and I was on all these awesome teams. And I saw these amazing structures, but I didn't realize that business was the same thing as, you know, an NFL team. You know, I was trying to be the player. I was trying to be the coach. I was trying to be everything all at once. And it just doesn't work. That's not, that's not how you win games. So uh, when I finally sat back, I started asking for help, Um, reached out to my dad who had been in business for over 32 years now. I had some local uh, business owners here. And one of them actually was, uh, the co-founder of Solo Stove, and they just IPO'd for $2 billion. And he's young. He's probably he's probably late 30s, uh, had nothing to do. And was like, hey, man, if you need some help, let me know. So I asked him, you know, what, um, you know, what, what should I do here? And, and it was all about, hey, hire, uh, delegate, put a game plan together, and a budget. Like, that was that was their biggest thing was, you know, what what is your budget? You know, what's your budget for for employees? You know, what's what's your budget for ads? What's your budget for each segment of the business? Uh, which was like, you know, I, I, I didn't even know what that meant uh, until I started talking through it with my dad. And, you know, this, this advice and what they said was, you know, once we finally put a budget and a game plan in place, we three X our profit. You know, I talked to my dad. He said, we three X. I talked to Solo Stove, their, their founder, three X the business. And, uh, you know, I, I finally said, dad, like, you know, how, just, what would you use? Like, send me it over. So he finally sent me over an Excel template. You know, each pillar of his business was broken down in it. Uh, so for our business, we took the same similar model. He, he's selling fitness equipment, so it's a little bit different. He has service departments. He has delivery departments, stuff like that. But for us, you know, we, we did the same thing, but we broke it down into marketing. We broke it down into shipping and warehouse. 
an engraving and uh, we broke it down into uh, into our sales team. And then we broke it down into what we call corporate. So we had four pillars for our business. We split them all out and then we said, hey, what's the budget for each one? And what's the goal for each one? Because you know the, the fulfillment team, they're not gonna make money. It's, it's a law center. So instead of saying, hey, how, how do you make profit with that? How do you, how do you save money? That's what we did. We said, hey, with, with the warehouse, it's not about making money. It's not going to be a profit center. So how do we reduce our costs instead? Uh, you know, and then your know, sales team, how can we maximize it? And then at the end of the day was how can you take these four pillars and make them all work together to reduce the, the most amount of cost, but also the most amount of friction as well? You know, the sales team, if they want to make the most money, they have to talk to the engraving team and, and, and see what works the best. You know, what's working the fastest? What, what engravings? make it the easiest for the team, what makes it the hardest, or what's taken the longest, longest to switch out for the machines, for the lasers to set up the next, next engraving, all that stuff. And once everyone started talking, the same thing happened for our business. Uh, once I put that game plan in place two years ago, we 3 x as well that year. And we've been growing uh, extremely fast since then. So uh, that was a huge, huge piece of advice that I got from, from multiple people. But the, the main two that I really relied on was my dad and then the co-founder of Solo Stove. Yeah, that kind of leads in nicely to the uh, next question here in the chat by Matt, and then we'll go back to Jared's question. But would you recommend someone get a business coach or first spend time learning on their own? Uh, I know mentorship is huge these days. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I wish I had someone that I could have saw do it first, like sat in on and, and, um, and shadowed. I, I've actually talked to multiple NFL players uh, since, since I retired and they said that was the best thing they ever did. Uh, the one guy told me for free, went in, like, you know, pr pretty much considered an internship, went into a, a high level, the CEO, and he sat behind him for a year just to learn everything that he was doing, how he ran a business. And he said it was the best thing he's ever done. He now runs uh, a company that's multi, a multi-million dollar company. So it's pretty cool to hear. Um, if you can get that experience, you know, that's, that's huge. Uh, if you can't, I absolutely, I think a coach would be a great idea. You know, if someone that's been there, done that, actually knows how to do it, can come in and show you how to do it the right way, and you can afford that, you know, that's that's huge. Um, I I, I would have never considered it because I, I was bootstrapping it hard, and you know, I, I would have not have put that money towards it. But looking back on it, it probably would have advanced us years, years ahead. So I would definitely recommend it, especially if you have no idea what you're doing. I mean, I had I had no clue at all. Um, you know, I was just, I was just winging it each and every day. Sales were taking off. You know, it, the more sales we got, you know, kind of just figure out a little, little more next step, whatever it was. But if I had that structure that we have in place now, we would accelerate it so much faster. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's really key to, to recognize that that coaching and mentorship really speeds up your timeline. You know, if, if, like you said, if there's somebody who's already been there, somebody who's already done it, it just makes a whole lot of sense to, to learn from them because it is going to help you out. You're going to just speed things up, uh, you know, tenfold usually. Um, yeah. I know my dad had a consultant come in uh, for his business in year four and uh, same thing, you know, they came in, he said they were so expensive that after three days he kicked them out. Uh, but within those three days, he learned so much. They changed everything for his business and uh, you know, they skyrocketed after that. So it, it's definitely worth the money. Yeah. Uh, Jared asks, how do you prioritize the tasks you need to complete within your day, week or month? Yeah, for me, um, huge, huge calendar guy. You know, every single day I'm going to have a calendar. Um, I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to get the most important things done right when I wake up within the first hour. Uh, then usually go to the gym after that to cool down a little bit, get refreshed, get my mind uh, you know, right again. Uh, but that's it. I mean, I look at it kind of like studying for a test. You know, if I had 30 minutes in college to study for a test, I actually did it. If I had two days, you know, I waited till that last 30 minutes to study or to get that project done. So, you know, put that same sense of urgency on yourself on a daily basis by setting up a calendar and saying, hey, you know, this time slot right here is for this time. I have to get it done within this time slot. And if I don't, you know, I, you know that's going to be a problem. So I, I try to use a calendar to really put that sense of urgency on myself now. Yeah, I'm a big fan of time blocking and, and putting it on the calendar. You know, just assigning an hour uh, and, and a task for every hour, breaking it up into 15 minute sections if you need to. But if you don't, if I don't put it on the calendar, it doesn't get done. You know, absolutely. That's even bad for me. 
and I don't think people, I never thought it was that important, but even social media, like I'll, I'll block 15, 20 minutes just for, Hey, I got to sit down social media. Oh, let me decline this real quick. Am I still up? Yep. You're good. And yep. uh, yeah, if it's important, uh Oh, Oh, there we go. I'm back. If it's important, I got to get it on the calendar and, uh, and I get it done. So you know, when I do that, I have a post up every single day because I've locked it off and I put that time for it. Hi, Chris. I'm Nancy. Thank you for tonight. Um, what has been your biggest, your most significant failure and what did you learn from it? Awesome. And uh, can you guys see me still? My mom keeps going. <laughs> Am I still there? Yeah, we can hear you. We can't see you, but tell Mrs. G we said hello. Yeah, I will. I'll hit her back right after this. <laughs> Uh, biggest, biggest failure. Um, let me decline this real quick. She's throwing, throwing me off. She's throwing my game off now. <laughs> uh, mom. Here we go. I'm back. I'm back. There we go. Uh, biggest failure. I would say um, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. My biggest failure was being in the way. I, I, you know, I, I think it was not delegating responsibilities early enough. Uh, it got to the point where uh, I, was, I was definitely working at least 80 hours a week. I was putting in as much time as I possibly could into it. But at the end of the day, like you're tired, you can only do so much. You can only put so much effort towards, towards one thing. And eventually it's, you start to suffer. So uh, my biggest failure was, Hey, you know, I would even bring, I brought in a marketing guy and uh, you know, here's my, my new marketing director, bring him in. And then I'd sit there and I'd still do the Facebook ads. And, you know, he, he would, <laughs> He would ask like, hey, what's going on with that? Can I take it over? And, and I felt like I hadn't do it myself. And when I look back on it, it was like, wow, you know, that, that's such a failure for everyone because I brought him in to do this job. Uh, then I pulled the responsibilities back from him that he was supposed to have. So all that did was take all his confidence away. And then when I finally gave him that responsibility, all of a sudden it was like, wow, you know, thank you. Like now he is a part of the team. He feels like a part of the team. And I had so much more production out of them because I finally delegated that responsibility to him without pulling it back and let him run on his own with it. So uh, I, I still think that's one of the hardest things to do as an entrepreneur, because it's your baby. You think you could do it better than everyone. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's not enough time in the day. Like if you want to grow, if you want to get to that next level, you, know, you have to be that coach. You have to look for that next opportunity to grow. That's where your time needs to be spent on. It shouldn't be spent on those things that you have other people that you brought in to do that work. So uh, yeah, it took me way too long, way, way too long. And it was always because I kind of like thought I was doing something wrong. Like I felt bad, like, hey, here's a responsibility that I know I can do myself. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just I don't know what to do here. So I, then I end up doing it. And uh, yeah. you just got to give it up. You got to give yeah. it up. If you want to grow. You become the uh, bottleneck there in that situation, you know. And, and, and here's here's an interesting scenario, too. We did a uh, my, my team did a uh, strength finders. And I found that a couple of the things that I hate doing, they actually love doing. So by yep. not giving them that task, not only was I screwing myself over, but they were pissed off because they didn't get to do it. And they're like, oh, man, I love that. Like scheduling and getting things in order. I hate that stuff. But they're like, oh, no, we love it. We'll take care of it. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me this in the beginning? You know, it was like complete mind blowing, you know, like, I can't believe I didn't know this. I didn't even think to ask you guys what you like, what you don't like, you know, and then once we did, we, we de delegated it out. Things got a lot better, a lot quicker. Yeah. Man, people actually feel like they're part of it now and they can make decisions for the team. And that, that was just one thing that in my mind, I was completely missing out on it. Uh, once we started doing it, that's when we got that locker room feel back. Like, Hey, everyone's a part of it. Everyone can make decisions. Everyone can help us get better. And then it started taking off. So uh, huge, absolutely huge with the business uh, and hard to do, very hard to do, especially early on. I had a follow up question. Um, when you were taking back some of his responsibility, was there any time where you felt like he just wasn't doing it the way you wanted it done exactly or it was just a control issue for you? And if so, how did you convey to him like this is my vision? I love what you're doing, but I kind of want it like this. Yeah, no, a lot of it was, uh, I would say, terrible training by me as well. Uh, and that was really what the truth is about it. Uh, you know, I didn't have any any game plan going into it. I didn't have any manuals written out, you know, stuff that I knew in my mind. And then it was kind of like, hey, you know, he'll just pick it up or, you know, he should know this anyways kind of thing. 
uh, where that's not the case at all. You know, it, it, you should have that responsibility already written out how to do it. If you want it done a certain way, let them know, you know, make sure you have that documented, make videos, screenshot it, you know, screenshot videos, uh, do all that. So that's what I finally realized and started to do. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, my marketing guy is a lot better than me because he actually knows how to get there, what we kind of, what I've seen, what I wanted to get done. And then he got better than me at it. So uh, yeah, at first it was definitely just, I didn't know how to train people and I didn't have the training uh, regimen down. So that, that's a huge part of it as well. You know, anyone is going to fail if they don't know what to do. And when they don't know what to do, most people aren't going to try to figure it out because they feel like they're overstepping their boundaries. Uh, so instead, you're just not going to get any production out of them. Uh, and they you always, know, at the end of the day, you're going to sit there and say, why, why is every employee so bad? And it's really comes down to a lot of times just the training that they're receiving. Thank you. Hey, Chris, I got one more question for you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned your pops being in the fitness industry for like 30 years. Um, I'm sure you and your family are no strangers uh, to the gym, to the weight room. So me being someone that would like to own a gym in the future, what do you think some things um, that make a gym successful? Yeah, man, uh, we, we never owned gyms, but we sell fitness equipment. Uh, so the, the gym market's hard, man. It's really hard. Uh, I still think that the most successful companies are the ones that build the best community. Uh, by far, I still think that's that's really what takes companies to that next, next level is, is that community feel. So uh, finding ways to uh, you know, get people to really feel a part of it, uh, to go home and then tell their friends like, hey, I went to this new gym. It was the best experience of my life. This is why. Uh, that that's absolutely massive in an industry where, you know, th there's a gym in every corner. Also, oh, it, it's very tough. So uh, customer service is huge. You know, my wife's business that we, we grew, uh, I was actually making more money with her business in the first three years. than I was playing in the NFL for three years and uh, it all grew just by customer service is what it came down to zero patents, nothing anyone else couldn't do. You know, we were on Etsy. Uh, we did it by just, just having, our products turn within one to two days, a lot of times, same day. And at, at that time, and even now, you know, to customize an item within 24 hours, sometimes within an hour was so surprising to people uh, that we were able to get it done that they would tell everyone they'd always come back you know, to buy more. And it just spread like wildfire. So all we did was, was take an idea, a concept that was already out there and we just did it better than everyone else. And it came to the point where everyone just told everyone and everyone kept coming back because we did such a good job. So, I think that's the same thing with the gym industry. Uh, and really, I, I would say almost every industry. You know, if you do a great job, if you do something that really stands out, uh, people are going to come back and, and they're going to appreciate it. At the end of the day, and as I get older and older, you know, everything's about convenience as well. You know, make it easy. Like make it easy for people to sign it up. Make it easy for people to bring a friend in. Make it easy for people to share as well. You know, if you got to sit there and maybe you put something up in the gym where they can take a photo at, you know, and it already has the hashtag on it and they could easily then tag your gym. That's huge. You know, social media is absolutely massive now. And you know, when you're at the gym and you're looking good, you're looking swole, whatever it is, you're going to take pictures. So if you can make it as shareable as possible, that's huge because then all their friends are going to see it. They're going to want to come to that gym as well. And that builds that community immediately. So uh, that's, that's, that's my recommendations really with everything. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I, and also, I love the team analogy you mentioned earlier, you know, where you can't be the player, the coach, the manager and all of that. So, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, one last thing. I saw you guys playing Flip Cup in the episode. Who would you say is the best Flip Cup out of you and your brothers? Flip Cup player. Man, yes. We, so we've been we've been playing a new game that we created called the Flip Zone on our YouTube channel. And uh, the <laughs> oldest brother, like this, he's lights out, man. You know, he's, he's been partying his whole life uh he's not married he doesn't have kids yet so he's uh he's he's quite the flip cup player he crushed us last time so i'm gonna give gordy the the crown right now gotcha he'll appreciate that one well chris yeah, we want to be respectful of your time man thanks so much for uh for coming on to to educate everybody on on all things entrepreneurship and the why behind it um 
what I'd like to do is kind of to reward uh, the people that are that are here live is we're we're going to do a giveaway and give one of these uh, these ice shakers away here tonight. Uh, everybody can just put in a number between one to ten in the chat. The first one to get the right number gets the giveaway. So have at it. What's the lucky three. number? It is three. Lucky number three. Tede Tede Ortiz, you get the ice shaker giveaway. So I'll reach out to you and get in touch with you for your ice shaker. But uh, Chris, thanks again so much, man. We, we appreciate it. Do you have any last takeaways for the group? Anything you want to, to give them as far as words of encouragement or last, last minute ideas? Yeah, I think we, I think we hit on a lot today. No, I think that was good. Um, I mean, anyone that's here right now, uh, eight, eight o'clock on a, on a Tuesday night, obviously cares, you know, enough to be here. You know, that's, that's definitely, the, the first step to it. So uh, definitely props to everyone that's here. I uh, appreciate your time. And if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out. You know, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Uh, email is definitely the best for me. Uh, it's simple, just chris at ishaker.com. But yeah, if there's a question and, um, you know, it's, it's something that's it's pretty important, you want a, a second opinion on it, let me know. I'm definitely willing to help. Yeah, and the uh, business- Chris, I have a quick question. Go ahead. I have a quick question, Chris. Do you have a coupon code for the rest of us? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> open up. We're supposed to do a live. So this is uh, it's still active right now. It's flip zone for 25% off. That's that's nice. our that's coupon code available right that's now. Great. Awesome. I'll get mine tonight. Thank you. For and sure. I think uh, the business entrepreneurs and private practice spe uh, student special interest group will also be working with Ice Shaker a little bit more over the next couple months as we uh, onboard all the other campuses. So uh, we're looking forward to doing a little collab with you guys moving forward. I'm pumped. Let's do it. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. We appreciate you, man. Be in touch hey, soon. Hey,